We offer all who have come this morning to worship to this the Lord's day. Let us lift our hearts and voices before our Creator this day, in thanksgiving for His provision, His gift of salvation through Savior Jesus Christ, and His presence through the Holy Spirit. Uh, announcements this morning. Sandy, do you have any more of your Lenten reading books? If no one got one, see Sandy if she still does. I'm even a couple days ahead on mine, so how about that? <laughs> John, the IMS committee is meeting Wednesday night. Wednesday night. All right, IMS meeting Wednesday night. Other upcoming dates? Uh, the Missionary Ladies fundraiser is going on. The announcement is that they're taking frozen pies and strobe moldies as a fundraiser from now through March 20th. You can place those words. Uh, Monday, March 7th, the Bible study on the 50 most important Bible questions at 7 p.m. at the church or by Zoom. Uh, the deacons meet 6.30 on Tuesday. Thursday the 10th is session 7. Dessert will be delivered for Meals on Wheels this Friday. And Sunday, March 27th, the Missionary Society will host a linger for lunch following worship. And then also the Easter order film is in your bulletin. Be sure to fill one of those out if you'd like to order a little. Uh, Joshua's Haven meal is to be delivered on the 31st of March. A sign of sheet is on the footboard in the narthex. And there's an announcement on Samaritan's Purse on the back of the announcements. You can check that out. And now I'll pray you. Oh, one more question. Yes. Does, does anybody know, are we doing men's breakfast here or in Fredonia next week? Uh, I'm not sure. But I'll find out and let you know, okay? Okay. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I guess I need to ask for them because they didn't, they canceled last month. Right, right. So and we'll, uh, we'll ask them if they want to do it this month, this, you know, soon, and, uh, and get back to you. All right, okay? thank you.
sins in every respect, it was tempered as we are, yet without sin. Tempered, excuse me, as we are, with, yet without sin. Let us then with boldness approach the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Our prayer of confession will be responsive. All the, kings, all the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have learned, heard the words of your mouth, and they shall sing the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. Lord, Lord give our pride, pride and feeble attempts to replace your glory, glory with what we be deemed worthy of our time and praise. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. Sometimes we confess, Lord, we are body, prideful, and finally more far away. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. When we trouble our fathers, when we bring fear and anxiety upon others, when we, unaware, find ourselves the enemy of another, woe is me, have mercy on us, O Lord. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. May you touch our lips with the burning coal of the atonement of Jesus Christ. Woe is me. Heal us, Lord Jesus. Our assurance of pardon this morning. Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ, and Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. May the God of mercy who gives all you all your sins strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. I know I 
I shouldn't have given you more time. <laughs> I, just came okay. I, I have a friend, I'll just use his first name. Uh, he's an atheist, and we go back and forth every week. Uh, my prayer is that I will continue to witness to him without shaking the dust off of my sandal and walking away. Okay. He is a good man, in spite of his disbelief. All righty. Okay, whoop. Yes. Well, praise God, yeah. Amen. Good for you. I'd say that's a joy. Uh-huh. All right. If you didn't hear, it's, she's 30 years post-cancer, right? And got a good report. All right. All right. Well, with these things in mind, let us come before our Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are indeed thankful to be able to come to you in prayer, that we don't have to depend on a mediator, that you, Jesus, are our mediator, that you take our prayers and lay them before your Father's feet at the throne. Your Spirit makes them pure and perfect. And so, Lord, though we struggle to know how to pray at times, maybe oftentimes, we can count on you to make it our words and our thoughts, pure and clear. So Lord, we lift up to you those that we ask prayer for. We give you thanks for the good news, my goodness, for Lowen, that Lord, she continues to get good news and good reports, this small child, and we just pray that she can begin to grow and be a normal child. We give you thanks, Lord, that for the good health that Sandy's been getting having for these last 30 years another good report. May that continue. And Lord, we lift up to you all those we know, Lord, who have been given reprieves, who have been cured of illnesses, um, who have peace and, and comfort in their lives. We give you thanks for that in our own lives. When we have seasons of um, seasons without pain, oftentimes as we age, the, the nagging pains and those things seem to just be a new normal. But Lord, we, we give you thanks for all that we have. It is true. Just like our mothers always told us, there's always somebody who has it worse than us. and There's no doubt about it, but sometimes, Lord, we confess we, we don't feel that way. Lord, we give you thanks that, um, that we are able to pray for those in need. We continue to lift up Kathy uh, and Pauline as she mourns. And, and Lord, we pray that for Christine that she's able to uh, defeat this bout with cancer, that, Lord, that it would have been caught early, and that all the outcomes would be as she would want, and her family be with them and grant them strength during this season of battle. We also pray, Lord, for Mike and others who find there's someone in their life that they keep witnessing to and struggling with and wrestling with and... Um, it almost feels like it's going nowhere, maybe. But Lord, you, you work within the inner heart in ways that we cannot see. Remind us that we are not the ones who do the saving. It is only for us to be a good witness, a good example of what it means to follow you, Christ. To, to be supportive and love them. And that we don't give up. Lord, we, we also continue to pray for this nation and the people of the Ukraine as well. We pray for all of our leaders, our, the, the world's leaders, during this time of unrest and, and war. We lift up to you those who are caught in the crossfire, as it seems as it is many. Lord, hear these our prayers. And all those things that are on our hearts and our minds at this time that have been left unsaid. We give you thanks, Lord, that during this season, as we begin the Lenten season, that you call us as a people to you, 
as individuals, you call us to take time, special time during this season, to, to really reflect, to be in your word, to make a, a new effort. If we haven't done it before, then it would be something new to us. If, if we've just gotten a little rusty and got off the wagon, then, Lord, this would be a good excuse to start a new habit again this season. I ask your strength upon all who, who maybe get back to your word, who get back to a little bit of time with you each day, to purposely invite you into our lives. To purposely ask you to show you throughout our day and how you're revealed in others through our prayers, through your word, through our worship, and through our thanksgiving. Father God, hear these our prayers. And hear us too as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue in our prayers of, prayer of gratitude, and return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth. upon this, a portion that we give to you. We ask your blessing and that you would use it to the glory of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And be seated. Well, today I get the privilege of beginning a, a series of messages uh, this Lenten season, this first Sunday of Lent. Uh, through what is called the Upper Room Discourse. Uh, this was the time in John chapter 13 through 17 when Jesus gathered his disciples uh, during the Passover. And they, would, they came together. And uh, this might be also known as that you, you would know it as the time of the Last Supper. That would be something that's well known for. That took place during this, this evening that we will be going through. So this first Sunday of Lent, I'm going to be reading to you from chapter 13 of the Gospel of John, verses 1 through 20, but we'll be focusing in mainly on 12 through 20, and uh, if you're curious why or what's going on there, well, come back Monday, Thursday, and you'll hear the other part, the first part of that chapter. But my question for you today that really is the question Jesus asked the disciples that night, and he asked us all who follow him, what has Jesus done to you? Let us pray for illumination, the reading and proclamation of God's word. Eternal God, we lay aside all that distracts and burdens us so that we may hear your still small voice. Speak to us the word of truth and grace. May you be all that we seek or desire. 
We ask that you meet us in our places of brokenness and need for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. Chapter 13 of the Gospel of John, beginning with the first verse. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, Not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on the outer, his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you. I knew, know whom I have chosen. But the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I'm telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you will believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me. Whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. This is the word of the Lord. We once were dirty and smelly in sin until Jesus washed us completely clean. That is the wind blowing something, right? Does anybody else hear that? Like knock, knock, knock. Somebody want in? <laughs> it was distracting me, so. Uh, Maybe I shouldn't say anything. Maybe nobody else heard it. You know, so we were. We were once dirty and smelly until Jesus washed us completely clean. But by some folks, you know, even my own actions and my own attitudes, sometimes I wonder if I'm truly clean. I wonder if we take Jesus seriously when he says things like in John 13, 8, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Meaning, if you do not receive justification meaning what Jesus has done to you, <coughs> you'll not receive the salvation and all his benefits. Mm. So what's happening in the story? <clears throat> what's going on here with this washing of these disciples' feet? Do we take Jesus seriously? And what has he done to you? What's he done to me? Well, <clears throat> I'll go into more detail about the foot washing thing on Monday, Thursday, and the actual act of Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. But for today's focus, realize that foot washing was an important ne necessity of the time. You know, the, the stuff that our, our Amish neighbors leave out on the road, the trails you see? Well, imagine if you had to walk on a dirt road or a dirt path with 
shoes that were open in places, that your feet could get dirty not only from the dirt, but the stuff critters leave along the path. Right? All kinds of things. Not just horses. Donkeys and camels and who knows what else. What else? So when they would come home or they'd come to somebody's house, like we would take our shoes off, well, they would do that, but then they'd need to wash their feet because who wants to track all that into the house, right? And if there was someone home, if you had children and you came home, the children were, were, would have been expected to wash your feet as the parent. If you would come home, um, you know, and grandma was there, grandma wouldn't wash your feet. No. It would be the kid's job. If you went to school and your teacher came in, you'd wash your teacher's feet, not the other way around. There was a whole pecking order with it, right? Or your boss would not wash the employee's uh, feet, right? So, now that you understand that, you might be able to start to see a little bit of the problem here and why Jesus, what was going on with Jesus washing his students, his disciples' feet. But there's more. Wait, there's more. So, needless to say, the servants or slaves wash the master's feet. Another thing that you've got to understand that's going on here that's not revealed in the Gospel of John, if you look to the Gospel of Luke, Luke 22, there's another little thing going on here. After Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper, the disciples get into a battle with each other. They get into this big debate about who's going to be first in the kingdom. All right? And they're going at it. So picture this. Here's the upper room. They just had this wonderful meal together, breaking bread together. Jesus says these amazing, mysterious words that they were like, your body, the blood, and, uh, you know, broken and given. Okay, so then they start going at it with each other. And they're in this big debate. And they're so in, into their debate, they don't notice something that's going on. Jesus strips down to his skivvies and puts a, a towel around his waist, like a slave, gets a pan of water, and he gets a towel, and he goes, and he starts washing their feet. Now, it's interesting, because it says, when he came to Peter. So that means he must have been washing some other guy's feet before he gets to Peter. And they're going at it, and they don't notice that Jesus is washing their feet. Because they're so into this bickering with each other, right? I mean, you can just picture this. Until they get to Peter, and Peter's like, whoa, not my feet. Again, we'll move ahead and leave something for Monday, Thursday. But to give you a little bit of the context of what's going on here. So Jesus finishes cleaning up their feet, and he puts his clothes back on, and he sits down at his place at the table, and he asks this question in verse 12. Do you understand what I have done to you? Now, I was plagued by this question all week long. For some reason, the Holy Spirit, God, put me right at that verse and just like a thorn in my side all week long. Why would he say, do you understand what I have done to you? Now, okay, so foot washing, it should have been the disciples' job, right? We've established that. But it took Peter to first notice it. You ever been, you, ever, you remember when you were a kid, anybody ever get busted, getting into a fight with a sibling or a friend or something, and you're really going at it, and maybe saying some things you should not to say in the house, you know, or anywhere else, really. And suddenly, one of you realizes mom or dad's standing right behind you. <sighs> I can tell by the smirk, some of you have witnessed this, or you've been involved in it. Or, if you're like me, one of, my, one of the things I'm not so proud of, when, when I was working uh, in, the, in the limestone mine, and... And I'm down, we, you know, everything's pitch black unless you have a light on and you're a mile back in under the ground. And it's a, it was a union shop and I go back and the, the union foreman, steward, whatever he is, the guy running the, the high lift, which controlled what I did. So I would back in and normally as soon as I backed in, he'd flash his, his light on his helmet at me and that meant to, to stop the truck. That that's, and he always had a bucket of stone ready so as soon as you backed in, he'd drop it. And, and he'd load it, and then he'd wave his head again, and that meant time to go. You're loaded up. So that's what we did. Time into, like 23, 24 times every single day. In and out, in and out, in and out. Boring, boring, boring. Anyways, so this one time I come in, and he, he gives me the signal to get off the truck, out of the truck. All right, shut the truck off, get out of the truck. He comes down off his high lift, decides it's time to shoot the breeze. 
okay. He's my senior. I'm, I've only been there like a few months at this time. So it's time to start shooting the breeze. And we shoot the breeze for a while. I'm like, I, I can remember two or three times going, don't you think we ought to get back to it? No, oh, no, no, we got time. So we keep going, we kibitz in there. And, and I don't know, I, I hope I didn't say anything bad. I think we were just talking about hunting or something, who knows. When all of a sudden, we both get hit with a bright light in our eyeballs. It's the boss. It's the owner of the mine. And he lights into us about taking up his time. He's paying for us to stand around and shoot the breeze. I'm feeling about this big. I'm pretty sure the foreman could have cared less. He'd been there forever. And what am I to do? Caught between the boss and the shop steward or whatever, you know? I hope I didn't say anything bad. But here the dude had been there for who knows how long, listening to everything we said. Busted. You ever been in a situation like that? <laughs> or, you know, like you see in the sitcoms, somebody's blah, 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 blah about somebody, and all of a sudden they're like, uh, he's standing right behind me, isn't he? It's like one of those moments. This is what I picture in this moment with the disciples and Jesus washing their feet. They're all bickered and going at it and trying to jostle for who's going to be first. Meanwhile, here's Jesus, their teacher, down on his hands and knees washing their feet. Talk about a humbling moment. This is the kind of effect of Jesus in this moment when he asks, do you understand what I have done to you? And you know it doesn't mean just the foot washing. There's something more to it. So obviously they don't get it. So Jesus tells them to go and do the same to others, meaning serve those less fortunate than yourself. Serve those less than, undeserving of your service, of your care, your love, to feed, to clothe, those less than, because of what he's done to them, what he's done for us. But no, Jesus asks, do you understand what I have done to you? Not do you understand what I have done for you. Now, I wrestled with this all week. Finally, Friday, I shoot a text out to my best buddy Jim Platt, Dr. Jim Platt, James Platt, who is, a, who is my, my Bible go-to guy if I'm just stuck on something to make sure I'm not off in goofy goofy land somewhere. So I shoot him a note and I'm like, Jim, what is it with this? And he's the language scholar. He knows all these languages that are extinct in the Bible, right? And if he ever listens to this, and I would be humbled if he did. But if he did, he'd be like, Mark, I told you, it's no big deal. Because when I asked him, he says, is there a difference? Why do they say two and not four? And he told me, don't get hung up on it. I'm like, well, too late now. I've been all week hung up on it. Oh, Bible scholars. So anyways, there's actually been books written on why two and four, it doesn't make any difference. So evidently, I've been wrestling with this all week for nothing. But I still don't buy it. Because I, I am a believer that the Holy Spirit starts twisting you up about stuff for a reason. So maybe if, so if you think I'm onto something, it's okay. You can come and play with me. If you think I'm not onto something, then just tune me out for a little bit and I'll bring you back. All right. So the difference between two and four. So if it's, do you understand what I've done to you? I ask you, is that different than, do you understand what I've done for you? Some of you may think, yeah, that is a little different. And other ones might be. So that's okay, either way. Now, I know Jesus spoke in Greek and Aramaic, and the translations are a little tricky into English, but to do something for someone seems like there's a charitable aspect to it. If I do something for someone, um, or someone does something for me, it's almost like they expect it to get something back out of it even. Like, like, at least it makes you feel good, right? If you do something for someone, it oftentimes make you feel, makes you feel good, right? That's all right. But to do something to someone, even sometimes, more often than not, seems like it might have a negative aspect to it. Usually when somebody does something to me, it's not a good thing, right? Somebody rear-ends you at a stoplight. They did something to me that's not good. So I got thinking, I thought, oh, wait, er, my English teacher always used to say, look it up in the dictionary. And see, some of you can relate to this. I actually have an actual Webster's hardback dictionary at my desk. 
I didn't Google Webster's because they just give you one little line. If you have a dictionary, a book one, it gives you like a whole big paragraph. So I looked at both paragraphs. There's a big long paragraph for four, there's a great big long paragraph for two. And I found the ones that apply to the context. And it still seems to me there's something different here. <clears throat> right? So, there is a difference, I think, when you say, like for instance, I gave a puppy for her, or I gave a puppy to her. Now, unless you know this her really, really well, guys, I wouldn't suggest doing that to the puppy. But anyway, but just for an example. If I gave a puppy for her, maybe that means there's some need this person has I'm trying to fulfill, right? But if I gave a puppy to her, then maybe that's like a gift, or I don't know. But I, I think there's a bit of a difference in the meaning, and maybe I have beat this horse too much. So why did Jesus say, do you understand what I have done to you? Well, I've given you an example of how to serve others, Jesus says, but more than that, Jesus has washed more than just feet. It's symbolic of Jesus having washed our sin away and made us perfectly clean. That's what Jesus has done to us. He underscores this in verse 16. He uses that, that truly, truly language. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who has sent him. Now, in the Bible, when Jesus uses truly, truly, this really means something. It's a big deal. When Jesus says truly, truly, it's like he's underscoring. He's highlighting. He's bolding. Full caps. Right? When you get a text and somebody uses all caps, they bold the underline and exclamation point. It means they're really excited. This is really a big deal. It really wants your attention, right? Well, that's what Jesus is doing. In the Greek, it's amen, amen, to confirm, to support something. It's a serious declaration. It's like doubles it up. And then when he doubles it up truly, truly, it's like adding emphasis. Jesus is underscoring the irony and the importance of what he's doing in this foot washing scene. This is a seriously humbling and attention getting move on Jesus' part. And it sure gets Peter's attention. To stress the importance of what's going on here, we even have to look at verse 19, where Jesus says, I am telling you this now, before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. He who? <laughs> All right, let's go back to the Old Testament, Exodus 3, 13 to 14. We hear this I am for the first time. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What's his name? What do I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Jesus says, I am he. I'll use the truly, truly here too. When he says, I am he. Jesus is clearly stating that he and the Father are one. He declares this. Think about this. If that's true, God just washed these men's feet. God just stripped down to his undies, put on a, a towel, and gets down on the feet and, clean, down and cleans these guys' dirty, muddy feet. Who knows what? That like takes your breath away when you really think about it. That's just mind boggling. It's amazing. It's beyond our human experience. But do we take Jesus seriously? When we hear this, when we read this, that he, he washes us, that he cleans us from our sin, does it change how we live? I mean, I sometimes question myself, do I take the gift of salvation seriously? Do I take it serious when I know that Jesus cleansed me of all unrighteousness and washed away my sins? You know, in this day and age, we've all, I think, gotten a little callous when people who are supposedly over us, leaders, parents, and so, far, so on, say something to us and they're serious. What teenager takes their parents serious when they get a lecture about something? Oftentimes we didn't. Or, or we don't. 
or your children don't take you seriously when you give them what for about something. Because many of us children had to learn things the hard way. And maybe it's just me, because I was a strong little child. So I'll confess that. Or not. I mean, seriously, I don't care who the president is, whether it's now or it was a few years ago or years even before that in, in recent hit American history, how many times do we really take our president seriously? They're politicians. Yak, yak, yak. And nothing ever changes, right? Or our news media. And again, don't care which side of the fence you fall on. All the news is the same. It's all commentary. It's editorial. Depending on which flavor you want to get and what you want to take. Do we take our news reporters seriously? Not to mention your preacher to the congregation. Do you take the preacher seriously? I mean, seriously. <laughs> and then there's my favorite one, the one that I struggled with most of my life. Do we take our doctors serious? When our doctors say, you know, you need to back off the salt. You know, you need to lose some weight. You know, you know, you know, you know, you know, right? You ought to do this, you ought to do that. And we, I think, because I live in a house with a health care provider, I hear the word non-compliant. <laughs> right? Do we take them serious? Until one day they say, uh, a couple of your arteries are blocked. Then things get serious, don't they? When we look at the story and we see what Jesus just did to the disciples and to Peter, do we take Jesus seriously? Maybe, maybe not. I'll give them a break. I'll give the disciples a break because Jesus did say to, to Peter and John in verse 7, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. So maybe they didn't get it. But what's our excuse? We know the rest of the story. Jesus is God. And God served his children, was betrayed by his children, and still he washes their feet. God Jesus went to the cross and died on the cross. He bled and had a terrible death to cleanse us, to wash us free from sin? Do we take him seriously? Do we believe it? Do, do we live it? Do we understand? Do we know what he did to us? I, I think we do as a church understand to some degree, and we do a pretty good job as a church of serving those less than, of, of helping people out when they're in need and stuff and care. We do a good job. But as an individual, only you know. Only you know how you measure up. Have we forgotten who Jesus is? I mean, maybe we can recapture a sense of what Jesus is talking about in the scene of having washed their feet as a sign of cleansing our souls. When Jesus died on the cross and his blood was spilt for our sins, it washed away our sins and it made us new. Jesus, we'll use this churchy word, turns out Paul uses it in the New Testament too, justified us. Jesus justified our sins before the Father. He made us clean so that we can stand before the throne of God. And it's why we can pray to God and not a priest. It's why I can call in the name of Jesus when I'm in trouble and when I'm not, and anytime I want to, and I don't have to go pay a priest to say a mass for me. Jesus justified my sins, and I am without guilt or shame. What's justification? All right, let's, not just because Mark says so. Let's look at the Westminster Shorter Catechism, one of our, the catechisms of our history and our church doctrine. Justification. Question 33, if you're taking notes, ask just that question. What is justification? What Je By the way, it's what Jesus did to you. So, Justification is an act of God's free grace, wherein he pardons all our sins, and accepts us as righteous in his sight, only for the righteousness of Christ imputed, that means replaced in us, to us, and received by faith alone. So in order for us to be saved, we must be justified, made new. Something happens to us we can't do on our own. It's not within us. It's not who we naturally are. It's being made right with God. Just... And Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. 
He starts out with, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And then he goes down this list. Do you do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And then he says this, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Then Jesus caps off the text in our reading today in verse 20. He uses that truly, truly thing again, so pay attention. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. We therefore receive Christ into our hearts and act accordingly. Not to say we're not going to sin again. doesn't mean we're not going to misbehave again but that we will have the Holy Spirit to walk with us, to guide us, to nudge us next time we're talking about the boss behind his back, and maybe you won't get caught then, or maybe you will. Depends on what the Holy Spirit wants to teach you today, right? So let us do as Paul teaches in Hebrews 10.22. Let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So as we look to Easter on this first Sunday of Lent, I ask you, what has Jesus done to you? And I would encourage you through the week to be praying on this. Take your bullet, it's right there in your bulletin, that question. And consider this. What's that mean What's it mean for how we live and how we walk this earth until Jesus returns or calls us home? Amen. Let's sing together, Be Thou My Vision, number 382. Son, the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen.